Hello and welcome back everybody to the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John and this is episode 210. Uh, each and every week I sit down here and answer your questions. If you have questions, send them to the podcast here at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, I do my best to answer each and every question. Um, this week, for example, I am going to edit out a few uh, points, some, some personal stuff from a few people. Uh, some other issues. Uh, I think that'll help with the flow. Uh, I have had some people say that when I read these really long questions that they get bored of the question, um, which I find fascinating, but we're happy to do it. So uh, here we go. Uh, our first question comes from Doug, and he says this. I liked listening to your podcast, uh, uh, and, and he's read several of my books. Uh, one of the things I like about your books is the suggestions for reading the back of your books. And when I want to, uh, when I want another book to read, I would look to those lists and pick one. Sometimes I have a difficulty uh, selecting one, so I thought I would ask this question: Easy Strength has five exercise categories: push, pull, hinge, squat, load, and carry, uh, which I think you consider essential. So, what five books would you consider for everyone to read, and why? I was planning to make the list and call it easy reading. If you want, you could create several categories for the book. Well, I, I like that. Um, you know, I was, I've worked on a list already for you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not home right now, so I don't have my standard little, I have a little uh, uh, yellow manila folder with all my book lists on it. Uh, and then inside the folder are articles and oh, just different things I've cobbled together th th through the years. Uh, different book lists, different uh, articles about the books I like. So, and by the way, I think that is still a great idea, folks. Uh, if you find something interesting, now <clears throat> we used to say you'd rip the article out of the out of the magazine and keep it. Uh, now maybe it'd be a good idea to just simply print it uh, and keep it. Uh, there's something magical about rereading something that you thought was important ten years ago, and when you read it with the you know. When you read something at 40 and now you're 50, it sometimes it's kind of fun because your brain goes right back to where you were and sometimes you learn good things. So in the area of self-development, I'm going to just start there. There's a book called Lead the Field by Earl Nightingale. <coughs> if you know my work, you know how much I appreciate Earl, Earl Nightingale's work. I mean, a lot of other people would say, you know, like Napoleon Hill and some other people. Uh, I've... I would agree with that, but I always found lead the field in the area of self-development to just be such a good piece of work. Um, there's so many books now on uh, personal development and, you know, defeating, overcoming all odds. And But I, I would just say in the area of personal development, anything by Earl Nightingale. And he's been gone for a while, but you can still certainly uh, appreciate when you listen to his work, and a lot of it's available here on YouTube. Um, along the same lines, uh, I always enjoyed the Bill Moyers interview with Joseph Campbell. Now, obviously, Joseph Campbell was important in my studies, uh, both on the history side and the religious studies side, but uh, I always thought the conversations with Bill Moyers were well worth the time. So. Maybe those would be two examples, The Power of Myth and Lead the Field. Um, for books, of course, everybody should know of my love affair. <coughs> Ozzy, I'm going to have to stop for a second. <coughs> Sorry. Everybody should know of my love affair with The Sword and the Stone by T.H. White. I always recommend the British 1938 version or the American 1939 version. Uh, the early editions of Wandering Waits had my four year study of The Sword and the Stone <clears throat> where I went paragraph by paragraph through the entire work, which is a lot of work, folks. But uh, The Sword and the Stone changed my life. It turned me into a reader. Fortunately, I had a good edition of the book uh, the first time I read it. The second time I had that 1958, the Once and Future King version. And I can remember thinking, did I make up these stories? Because they weren't in the book. They had edited out some of my favorite stories from the original, which is kind of crazy, I think. 
Uh, I also include Dune on this list, the original, not the follow-ups. I, I did not like any of the books after the first one, sadly. Though I understand there is a book now that picks right up on the story uh, at the end of the events of the first book. But yeah, I, I like Dune by uh, Her Frank Herbert a lot. Uh, I include The Godfather on this list usually. I, I think the reason I like The Godfather so much is it's such a, a such a fascinating, the book and the movies, maybe not three, of course. I've always told people there's Godfather 1, there's Godfather 2, and then there's the movie with Matthew Broderick called The Freshman, which I think is a very underrated film. Uh, it's much better than Godfather 3, if you ask me, obviously. Uh, but The Godfather, the book, is uh, a real epic and worthy of consideration. <clears throat> I also include on my list here the first three Hitchhiker's Guides to the Universe books. Uh, I thought they were wonderful when they came out. And then after that, I didn't like the book so much. Uh, I think, I can't remember, it was so long, and Thanks for All the Fish or whatever. But I just got confused after a while. Um, uh, I've also included two others, uh, Skippy Dies. Skippy Dies, it's a, it's a great book. Uh, I think another epic. Uh, I've, had, I've recommended it. People have gotten actually mad at me for recommending it because there are some uncomfortable scenes in the book. But at the end of the book, you are the only person to know the whole story, which is kind of a fun way for an author to fill, uh, finish a book. Uh, it's by Paul Murray. And I'd also recommend, I just reread it again, Chad Harbach's uh, book, um, The Art of Fielding. Again, another book, fairly epic. Uh, uh, the second half of the book is, is a lot more, um, uh, it, it, if you're a coach, it's really quite good. It's the mental side of things, and I thought it was really interesting. Uh, Chad also, and I have some copies of, of my books here in the, uh, in, the, in the room here. Chad wrote the forward of one of my books, and, and I always appreciated that. So uh, when we get into the weightlifting side, not every book I'm going to recommend is easily available, but these are the ones I, I seem to go back to the most. Tommy Kona's book, uh, weightlifting Olympic style. I know it's really hard to get. I apologize. I thought the book was outstanding. Um, I wrote down Arnold's The Educational Bodybuilder. Uh, I bought the book uh, the very first day it came out, and I was the first person to buy the book. Uh, I got a hard copy. Don't know where it is. I, I, lo uh, I, I loaned it out years ago. And if you do have my copy, yeah, would you get it back to me? It would be nice. Uh, if you actually read the book, it's pretty good. If you actually follow his, follow his wisdom on training, it's outstanding. Having said that, no one follows what he says, so I don't know why he even said that. John Jesse's book, I think it's called The, the Encyclopedia of Wrestling Conditioning. Um, Bill Hinburn's site has it. Uh, a lot of people, when I recommend the book, will look at it and say, well, it's just a mishmash of everything. Right, because it's an encyclopedia. And it is a mishmash, eh, it's not a mishmash. He goes through everything, uh, ligament training, isometrics, anything you think got invented, it's already in the book, which humbles me when I look at it. Um, Marty Gallagher's Purposeful Primitive, which I still consider probably the best book Dragon Door ever came out with. It is by far, uh, it's very simple programming. Everything's quick and to the point. He does a great job talking about meditation practices. He does a great job talking about cardiovascular training. His diet section at least will challenge you. And then when you get into the nuts and bolts of how he trains in the book, it's fantastic. There's a follow-up book to it called Strong Medicine. Um, and I would just recommend Strong Medicine for Marty's materials. Now, if you like Marty's stuff and you're a member of danjohnuniversity.com, we have a nice, we have a, a something that was given to us from Marty for the site, and it is, it is, it is, it is fantastic. Basically, it's the materials you'd find in Strong Medicine, but it's, it's really good. Uh, the next book I have, of course, is the book that really changed my approach to training. Uh, it's Phil Maffetone's book, Everybody is an Athlete. And I know Phil Maffetone has become extremely popular now, but when I first read his work back in 86 or 87, he, you know, no one had ever heard of him, and I, I loved his insights and training. Um, this is one of the rare trips I haven't brought the book with me because I brought some other books I want to uh, uh, almost memorize. Um, uh, Maffy Tone's work is very good. His strength book is outstanding. Uh, I would also say that uh, 
like he has a book on training for golf. It's a very simple book. Don't you know? It's, it's you know, but his training program and I think his golf training program is online. But basically, I think you do a set of squats for five. You rest. You do a squat, a set of deadlifts for five. You rest. Squats, deadlift, squats, deadlift, squats, deadlift. And I look at that and I'm like, that's pretty interesting. And it'll actually uh, help me uh, think about uh, think about how I coach athletes sometimes when we're just doing a more power phase uh, uh, with discus throwers. I still believe you got to break the ear up a little bit. Uh, I do like to mix the athletes from doing a, an exercise like a front squat with a snatch. It's not exactly the same as deadlift squat, deadlift squat, but the concept of having those two extreme exercises next to each other is, I think, really helpful and a really interesting way to get an athlete in very good shape. Um, I hope that helped. Um, I have a new book coming out, Easy Strength for Fat Loss, and I think you'll get a sense of at least some of the authors here that I've mentioned. Um, one of the things I keep trying to do is I keep trying to make things simpler and simpler. Um, I, I wrote an article one time called Simple Strength because easy strength seemed to be too complicated. <laughs> and that still makes me laugh. But um, yeah, Easy Strength for Fat Loss will be coming out. And honestly, uh, for most people, if we just can get you to lift and then walk, uh, there's all kind of magic that happens. Very good question. I always enjoy those kinds of things. Thank you. Got a question from Brandon. Now, Brandon has a good issue. Uh, Brandon says this, you advise using high rep back squats for mass building, which I do, because I think they work really well, which has always worked well for me. However, a few months ago, I switched careers and became a framing carpenter, which is a very physical job. It often has me lifting and carry heavy things and walking on top of walls and roofs. Needless to say, doing some of these activities with legs that have been shredded from a bunch of back squats is challenging and some and sometimes downright unsafe. So before I even get going, Brandon's point right there is important. Uh, before I answer his actual question, sometimes you get into a career where, you know, your your physical goals don't match the requirements of your career. Uh, I mean, I knew uh, I knew a bodybuilder who once he had. Uh, he had turned his office basically into a recovery lounge. Uh, he had a cot in there for napping. He had uh, he had his blender in there. Of course, every bodybuilder in the blender. Uh, he had a slow cooker in there. And I think he had a George Foreman grill before they were found to be so unsafe by Michael Scott. Um, if you don't get the, if you don't get the reference, it's okay. Um, <laughs> could you? It'd be kind of fun to be sitting next to the guy who is, you know, every few hours you hear a blender go off, you smell, you smell meat cooking and, you know, some business place. Uh, sometimes you can make your career support your physical goals. I did that in the last years of teaching when I had a refrigerator, a cot, a blender, uh, uh, God, I mean, so much protein powder. I also had other coaches who, you know, were also involved in some of these things. We, we, we uh, etched out an hour and a half training period every single day. So there are times in your life where you can, your career and your physical goals can dance pretty nicely. I mean, if you want to be an elite, I don't know, uh, a, a long distance runner, a triathlete, and your job is, you know, long haul bus driver where you, you know, you take people on trips, you know, nine hours a day and you know or in overnights uh, might impact your training a lot so there has to be a balance sometimes in your case i like what you said you know you could put yourself in a dangerous situation with exhausted legs he then says now the question have you had any success with a mass building program that is easier on the legs uh no like yes or no questions. Um, in Pavel's book, Power to the People, he argues that the BEAR program can work well for mass building. Uh, my friend TJ uh, is doing that. It's clear he's done well. So I would recommend not, uh, I wouldn't do the side press that's in the book. I would do military press probably. But if you did um, those BEAR style uh, deadlifts, so that's sets of five with somewhere between 60 and 
80% of your best set of five. Remember that. It's not your best deadlift. It's your best set of five. And you try to get, I mean, you just do, you do a set of five. You do a set of five. You do a set of five. And you work your way up to very high reps in the deadlift. And I would also suggest uh, thinking about that with the press too, or press variation. Um, before anyone asks, power to the people works well for those of us who are hinge pushers. Uh, it seems to work well for uh, someone who's been training a certain style for a while and then decided just get strong in one or two lifts. So it does seem to need a little bit of background to work well for most people to use the bear program. In your case, the bear program might work. But now, you know, if you're doing 20 sets of five in the deadlift and then have a physical labor job, you know, I'm worried that, you know, the, the, the system just might break down. Um, you could also, and this is just an idea, uh, you could join uh, a more uh, traditional gym and uh, use machines. Uh, I was thinking about that. Um, Brandon, that's not an answer uh, I would uh, always give somebody. I'm guessing you're a, a younger person by, the, the, by, the, by what you're saying here. Younger, I mean, you know, sub 60. Um, but usually I, I reserve machines for, you know, people over 55, and for good reasons, because people over 55 need to build lean body mass, and machines seem to help with that. But, uh, you know, the only problem with machine training is, you know, I've been told that the leg extension's hard in the knees, certain leg curls seem to just give you leg cramps, not any real leg, uh, any muscles. There's always those clowns in the weight room putting excessive weight on the leg press and making all kinds of noise. And, they, and sometimes they don't even look like they've lifted weights uh, after a couple of months of that. But if you do them with um, good technique, uh, appropriate intensity, machine training can be outstanding. Uh, again, you probably have a six to 12 week window on it. And then after that, it might not help very much. Um, he then asked at the end, should I just stick to something as simple as easy strength? If, if you want your training to support your job and your life, easy strength might be a really good answer for you. If you're chasing hypertrophy, I wish you to give me a little bit more why, like if you want to be a champion bodybuilder or you just want to look good on the beach. Uh, it's summertime and it's going to sound rude, but it doesn't appear to me that a lot of people care to look good on the beach anymore, but I'm bunch, but uh, yeah. Um, but if, if you, if you want to, you know, look good, feel good, um, you know, you might want to do the machine approach. If you want to just stay strong and keep prepping yourself long term for, for life and any uh, activities you want to do, easy strengths are answer. I gave you a bit of a either or there, uh, you know, use your own insights and uh, good luck on that. Okay. Thank you. That's a very good, it's a very good question. And one thing for all the listeners, um, keep reminding yourself about, you know, the different parts of your life. Um, if you're missing your kids' school play or football game because of your, your workout or your training, you're missing, you're missing so much other stuff. Uh, if, if, you know, if you're sacrificing your long-term health to look good at 25, you know, for a trip somewhere because you're taking stuff, you're injecting stuff or whatever. I, I just think you're going to have regrets later on. In the last few weeks, uh, I've, again, this is every, I, I could say this every single day the rest of my life. I've had a few uh, people I've competed against who were younger than me who've died. And uh, the last times I've talked to at least one of them for sure gave me a lot of regrets about some of the life decisions he made in his 20s. Uh, some of the damage we do is unfixable stuff. So just, just remember folks, sometimes your goals have to be in line. My goal, my original goal was to pay for all my education and all my travel as an athlete. I, I did that. And I'm very happy to say that the nice thing is outside of, you know, surgeries, the price I have paid has been fairly reasonable. 
And honestly, as I sit here in this chair speaking to you, even the injuries are all behind me. I'm all healed. I feel very good. Uh, I work out every day. I walk every day. I swim and snorkel at every opportunity. Um, so just keep in the back of your mind that your fitness goals should support your financial goals, should support your family goals, should support your community goals. Should you know? It should just keep spiral, spiraling upwards together. Thank you. That's a good question. We got a question from Frederick. He has two questions. Specifically, I would like to know how athletes can benefit from aligning their training approach with the natural cycles of growth, challenge, rest, and refinement. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about farming. Just as farming experiences spring for sowing seed and nurturing growth, summer for tending and maximizing productivity, fall for harvesting and reaping rewards, and winter for rest, reflection, and preparing for the next cycle of growth, how can weightlifters apply these seasonal principles to their training to optimize their progress and performance? Well, this has been some, I think in the second published article I ever had uh, in weightlifting, I talked about my seasonal approach. Uh, in my inner circle, uh, which is just a wonderful thing, uh, one, of the, one of our inner circle members, Ted, is actually doing this advice. So basically, fall is the most disciplined time of the year, at least where I live. That's American football. That's when school goes back. Uh, that's when all the kids have all their new binders and folders and their backpacks and everything's neat and clean and organized. Uh, I think the fall is the best time of year to do a real organized program. Uh, if you're doing my stuff, I mean, like, for example, the RKC prep program, you know, it's a, what is it, 12, 13 week prep program. It's very focused. It's got, you know, real clear, you know, real clear goals at the end, real you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, and at the end, you do this. Uh, I like structured programs. When you see a program, uh, I think some of those, you know, squat your way to success in six weeks or whatever it is, you know, those are great programs for the fall. In the winter, I'm, I've been advising people for years, go heavy, go hard, go home. I think the winter months, you should uh, try to find a training program in which you, 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 hit big loads and you walk out the door. Uh, whether you do it with the power lifts, the Olympic lifts, uh, uh, power body building, that phrase Pavel uses sometimes, which I, I think is a good term. Um, you know, get the job done and go home. Uh, I like that. When spring comes around, uh, it's spring, you know. Here in the United States, you know, we have baseball and track and field. Uh, I'm sure in the rest of the world, you know, we, everyone moves outside in the spring period. Um, I think spring is a great time to, to, you know, get your running in again, get your play in again. And of course, summer, I would say is, you know, just, yay, go have some fun, you know, do like I do. You know, I, <laughs> I'll walk for an hour and a half. And then uh, like yesterday, um, on this walk I went on, uh, I swam in two lakes. So I walked, swam, walked, swam, uh, I walked home. Uh, that's just wonderful. Uh, I did my hip thrusts before. It, there's no organization in this. I didn't time myself in my walk. I didn't, you know, I didn't time how long I was in the cold lake. Just had fun. Um, in our world, you, you might be able to do it this way. So maybe do a kettlebell focused training program in the fall. Kettlebell programs seem to have a lot of discipline. In the winter, maybe do a powerlifting focused program. Uh, in the spring, maybe Olympic lifting and or maybe get yourself into some track and fieldish kind of event. And then in the summer, you know, play ultimate Frisbee, play volleyball, uh, maybe compete. Um, I, I like that. In fact, that's ac actually a real good way to go through life too. Uh, you know, we had this conversation years ago on, on the uh, uh, Dan John University Forum about how you should probably Olympic lift when you first start to train, because you know make sure you have that mobility and all those technical qualities. Then power lift, and then body build. Uh, body building is probably the most appropriate for people over 55. So, in your athletic years of your life, Olympic lifting. When you start getting more busy uh, and getting you know life, <laughs> life happens. Uh, power lift, and then as you 
turn towards retirement and, and the golden years, body build. So yeah, I'm a big believer in cyclical training. Um, when it comes to rest, I've always thought that good training programs build rest in. Um, but let's go to your second question because I think we're going to uh, uh, get to the next point I want to make and I think you'll ask the same question. On a practical note, suppose a strength athlete enjoys running and wants to incorporate it into the training uh, program. However, they are based in a colder climate where running is primarily feasible during spring to fall seasons, while winter brings colder temperatures. How would you advise this athlete to navigate the seasonal aspect of running without compromising strength qualities during the warmer months and condition qualities during the colder months? Well, you probably could do the exact same thing. Uh, I always thought that, you know, if, if you do just stick with the natural cycle, uh, I think you're okay. Now, obviously, long walks in the winter uh, are gonna depend on where you live. Where I live, um, it's actually really nice to go for walks in the winter. Uh, yeah, you know, I live in a high desert. It's very cold. But after a storm leaves, the roads are usually fine. And, uh, and you know, not, not always that day, but, you know, within a day or so. So long, long cold weather walks, I think is one of the, it's like one of my little secrets for long-term success. Uh, I tend to go all out in, uh, with my arms bare. Uh, I will bring a, I will bring a hat of some kind and I'll, I will wear gloves. I have an issue with my hands from a frostbite problem back in the eighties. Um, I don't worry too much about bundling up whether or not it's true about exposure, uh, skin exposure to the cold being good for you, I don't know. But since I'm only exposing uh, certain parts of my body, I don't think it's so bad. You know, I'm not gonna walk out in my neighborhood in the winter, you know, in a Speedo or anything. I think my neighbors would call the, uh, call the authorities of some kind. When you get to the spring, uh, if you've been doing your walking or whatever you can get in in the winter, as you get to the spring, I would not instantly gear up to sprinting but I would have a transition time. Um, the, the Swedes have that great word called fartlek, which means speed play. And that's when you, you know, you, you go for a walk, you sprint a hill, you jog a grassy area, you do some strides on a soft sandy area. Um, and you just, you, you kind of just play around with your different speeds and rhythms and exercises with no real plan. I think it's a great way to come out of the winter time. In the summer, of course, if you're taking what we're talking about seriously, uh, I, th I think the summer would be a great time to really up the dial here and get some sprinting, hurdling, whatever's appropriate in your life. Uh, when it comes to the fall, fall, uh, uh, I'm just looking out the window. I'll be doing a, uh, I'll be doing a 10K here in two weeks, uh, which just makes me laugh to say it out loud, but. Uh, Fall is a good time for a long distance. Uh, it's eased off. Uh, the weather usually is eased off a little bit. It's not as humid in some places. It's certainly not as hot. And going for those long distances can be a real, real boon. So as you finish, the, and, and if you will, as the season of autumn fall comes to an end, uh, you would go long, slow distance. Start off with just long distance, long, slow distance into walking into speed play, into sprinting, into distance. And that's just one approach. And I'm sure you can just take the concept I just said and make it work for you. Thank you, that's, that's a good set of questions. I've got a question from Joe, and it's short. My question is in regards to strength training duration. I have heard you say anything works for six weeks. Yeah, any, any idiotic thing you do will work for about six weeks. Uh, I've been lifting weights since 1965. That's a lot of six week periods. You can do a lot of stupid stuff in over, almost, yeah, over 50 years in the weight Almost, yeah, way over 50 years in the weight room. I've also read that uh, many times that 12 weeks is a good length of time. What say you, says Joe? Uh, it's one of those questions where both are right. If you do an organized, smart program, uh, one of the things you'll pick up is 12-week programs, and Marty Gallagher does a great job with 12-week programs. Um, other people, uh, I think, are right of uh, the rite of passage, 
the one, the RKC prep program, Dan John University will, will be there for you. I think you'll find that, uh, yeah, it's it's a 12-week program, but really it's two six-week programs. Generally is what happens. You tend to have a six-week higher volume, and then a six-week, let's go get it. So, I yeah, I think 12 weeks is a good amount. I'll say this. The year is divided into four 13-week periods. And 12 weeks, and then have that, I would say, take that extra week off as rest. But not many people listen to that rest part. Um, you know, if you could work it out and, and, and you had four different things you want to work on in a year, that wouldn't be too bad. I have some caveats I'll get to in just a second. But if you decide to... If you decide to go after it for 12 weeks, a couple things. First off, I think you need more time prep to prepare yourself for a 12-week push. Um, that's one of the reasons I think Easy Strength has been working so well for a lot of my uh, more seasoned and advanced people uh, because they take, you know, uh, two 40-week programs, Easy Strength back-to-back. -back, that's about 16 weeks. And so after the 16 weeks where you're going in, and you're nudging your loads up, you're, you're getting the workouts done quick. After those 16 weeks of doing it, you know, or so two, two times through, now it's time to go. So you have this broad platform, and now we're gonna build up on it. If you're a runner, I think this is what burns runners out. I think you can only train, huh, and this was true when I was a collegiate athlete, uh, you really can only really push, push, push about 12 weeks with intervals and the high intensity stuff. Um, one of the interesting things is I still think uh, when I, in my perfect track and field program, we would have three track meets a week for our sprinter and middle distance core. And that would be their training session. And I would have them do all kinds of like relays and things like that. Because when you get a, if we're doing the eight by 200, which is a fun relay you see in uh, some invitationals, it's, it's hard for a team to come up with eight great 200 meter runners. So you get such a myth, mismatch, it's fun to watch. But if you give me the baton and someone's 15 meters ahead of me, I'm gonna run faster trying to catch them than I ever would push in training. So one of the things I discovered as a, as a head track coach is that the way to get the sprint core to go to train appropriate for sprinting was to get them as many track meets as I could. Um, you know, your mileage may vary. But you don't have a lot of time to do that. You have about 12 weeks to do it. In those 12 weeks, you also have to be very careful. So any of you now who want to do a 12-week program, let me give you some warnings. First off, I think you have to be really careful. Uh, getting back to Phil Maffetone, in the first edition of his book, um, everybody's an athlete. He said, uh, you shouldn't get a haircut on the week you compete. But his logic was this, and this is why I thought it was brilliant. His logic was, if you can't find a week where you're not competing, you're probably overtraining. You're, you're going too hard. And that alone, I thought was a brilliant insight. So <laughs> I'm not saying tell you not to get a haircut if you're going to do a 12 week hard program. I'm just saying, think about it that way. If you're always going hard, trust me or not, you're always going medium. And medium is something I don't like. I wrote an article years ago called I Hate Medium or something like that. Uh, my friend had come up to me at a, at a workshop and he said, he said, you hate medium, don't you? And I go, what do you mean by that? He goes, because how do you, why do you say that? Because he goes, you always say you hate medium. My thought is this, you know, your daughter comes home from college. She tells you on the phone she's met the love of, the li uh, of her life. She comes home and, and, well, what's he like? He's okay. Well, what, how tall is he? Yeah, he's average. Was he, you know, was a good-looking guy or what? He's okay. Oh, is, do you got any interest? Yeah, I guess so. I don't really. To me, that's what medium is. You know, I like the high highs, and I'll put up with the low lows because of them. So, if you're going to do a 12-week program, <laughs> don't get your hair cut. That's a joke. You do what you want. But one of the things I really recommend uh, when you're doing a program like that is this is. These are kind of odd recommendations. I don't like people using uh, sport drinks to get their electrolytes. I really push my athletes to uh, eat a lot of vegetable soup while they're in a peaking mode. And um, 
I have a couple of recipes. Uh, basically, get every vegetable you can, put it in a crock pot, you know, <laughs> come back the next day and you've got vegetable soup. Um, there is one that I like. I don't want to recommend it because, it, you know, there might be some issue I don't know about. But it's a vegetable soup. It's 130 calories, and it's got a pop-open can. And I got to tell you, if, you're, if you've got an athlete who's in an office, a school setting, if they have access to a microwave, they can always... This can be a snack meal. And by the way, throw some kim, take some kimchi along. Oh, your office mates will love the kimchi. Uh, and, and you have a pretty good uh, uh, snack. Um, I gotta be careful. I was about to say the mineral content, but it, the vegetable soup with the salts and the minerals seem to support hard training. I know that sounds weird. You probably can only do three hard days a week if you're doing uh, a hard program. If you have a hard, if you have a program that calls for five days a week going hard, I don't know if you're really going to do it. Uh, and you have to do the program. I also consider competitions as a hard training day. So if you are in a situation like you're a Highland Game athlete where you compete every Saturday, or uh, maybe you're a, you know, a, a, a runner who does, you know, those 10K five, you know, the bagel 5Ks and stuff like that. Remember that day is a competition day. So. The other two days, those two training days, the competition day, that's your training. The other four days are recovery days, technical practice, whatever you need to do, but you have to take things easy on them. Uh, sleep is is a must, and if you're not getting seven to nine hours, if you're not getting, well, I, I, mean, I think nine hours, but you know, seven to nine hours is that number, you have to. When it comes to some other things, uh, like recovery tools. I'm looking over there, uh, uh, right there. There's my massage gun. At home, I have my sauna next to me. I think you need to ha really take recovery seriously. So at least one day a week, I would make it is your magic recovery day. You know, that, uh, as I tell people, that when I use my massage gun, I stick it in the palms of my hands. I stick it in the balls of my feet, uh, the the palms of my feet, whatever that's called, uh, my uh, my hip flexors, and then I try I try to move my hamstrings and stretch. I stretch my hamstrings and use the gun on them. Um, hands, feet, hip flexors, hammies. Those seems to be the one for me that is the biggest boom boom for the, the bang for the buck. I, I almost put together two cliches right there. Not bad. Uh, when you train, train hard. Think of it this way, go, go to the great Charlie Francis. What's wrong with most programs? Their highs are too low and their lows are too high, meaning again. So if you're gonna do this hard program for 12 weeks, on the hard days, on the days you go into the gym and train hard, you train hard. On the days you recover, you recover hard. Don't have, you know, don't skip your recovery days. Don't skip your mobility work. Don't skip your flexibility work. Don't say, oh, I'll catch up my sleep on the weekend. No, you've got to, you've got to do what you got to do for those 12 weeks. And when you finish those 12 weeks, be finished. Uh, that's one reason I, I like to peak uh, when I do Dave Turner's Olympic lifting program. Uh, when, I, when I lift in the meet uh, on Saturday, when I when I put that last clean and jerk down and I get the three white lights and everyone applauds, yay for me. I'm done. I don't Olympic lift for a bit. Uh, I, I would like to take four weeks off, sometimes six weeks off after and slide over to a traditional three by eight bodybuilding program. But uh, there are times where I just, uh, you know, I don't have the six weeks for the next weight to meet, but I still try to go done for at least two weeks as best I can. Uh, I do more mobility during those two weeks. I care a little bit more about my joint health those two weeks. But once you finish that 12 week program, be finished. Uh, one of my knocks about people who say they're bodybuilders but they never compete is they just become medium. I think it's really important to have that bulk up phase and that ripped phase. Uh, I think it's really important, well, the modern ripped phase, you, the modern bodybuilders seem to stay in better shape than they did there for a while ago. You, you might not remember some of those pictures of some of the uh, 80s and 90s uh, competitors who just looked 
you know, very out of shape when they were not in comp competition. I, I don't know how healthy that is for the body, you know, to go from ripped to, you know, <laughs> to go from 3% body fat to 30, I don't know how, or 40, I don't know how good that is for you. But, you know, those are just some ideas. When you're finished, be finished. Um, you can probably do six week programs, you know, forever. I, I, I would worry about, you know, how you're gonna measure progress doing that. But if you do decide to go after it for 12 weeks, go after it and then take some time off. It's a good question, Joe, thank you. Uh, Dante asks a question and uh, he's, he's asked questions before. Back on episode 93, that's back in time, you opened up the observation about how after dropping 30 pounds body weight, you felt you needed to rethink your overhead strength. Yeah, this has happened to me a couple of times. Uh, the most classic example uh, would have been uh, 1991, where I weighed 124 kilos, 273 pounds, and then I dropped down to 110 kilos, 242 for weightlifting meets. And uh, and then after that, when I when I when I leaned out after that, I saw the same thing happen. What was happening is very often my my lockouts and my my overhead support strength will go. Now, there's a pretty logical reason for it. You know, when you you know when you have that extra 10 kilos, you know, that goes into your keg. You know, that goes into your that goes into your column, your support structure. I mean, that's the most obvious reason. Uh, I did notice, you know, years uh, about when, I, especially when I was really driving my squat numbers up, I got that massive stomach that I never wanted, you know, I always wanted to be, you know, when I was throwing the discus the best, you know, I, you know, I was, my stomach was in a good place. And when I really started putting those squats, those big squats up, my stomach just got bigger and bigger. One of my powerlifting friends, a very famous person, in fact, said that was actually good because that distended belly uh, countered the load. And I thought, well, okay, and but you know, of course, long term, even then, the back of my mind was saying, this isn't good for your health and longevity. It's good for your performance, but not good for your health and longevity. So, when you put weights overhead, you know, you got that bone on bone lockout, you got your support structure, and then you have that anaconda strength. Don't take you're asking me a question, uh, the, the final question, and I want. He says, it's funny, use the word spongy. He notes in, in a, in a follow-up comment, comment that his overhead work feels spongy, spongy. Which is why, uh, Dante, I came up with this concept called anaconda strength. This is going to sound weird, but doing heavy suitcase carries, really heavy, helped my overhead support because it taught my body to knit. Uh, Heavy sandbag carries helped me throw the discus farther because it taught my body to knit as I came around. So it's weird. The answer, if you're going to lose weight in your in, in your front squats, your your overhead work is spongy. That is anaconda strength. Uh, anaconda. I used to call it inner tube strength. Um, it was from the 1964 Olympic hammer champion. He said you just train your body like it's an inner tube in a bicycle, so it's real tight. Uh, I thought that was, it's still a great image, but inner tube doesn't doesn't have the magic sound that anaconda has, you know. So anaconda is that squeeze, that lockdown that you get uh, when you're training. Um, you mentioned you, you struggle with front squats because I would put front squats in that column of exercises that would help with that. Uh, if that's not helping you, maybe the overhead squat will help. Uh, suitcase carries heavy sandbag carries, any uneven work you can do might help. Uh, that's why I'm such a big fan of the one arm bench press uh, with the free hand free, is that as that load comes down and you know, it should be, you got, you know, you know, I should be using 110 to 125 pounds. As that arm comes down, my whole body is fighting to keep that in there. And then I press up. Single arm uh, overhead presses, a single hand presses overhead, half kneeling, standing, seesaw, the whole family help. But I still think your suitcase carry, your sandbag carry, uh, the one arm bench press, 
those would be the top three I would say for most people are the best on, on keeping that up. Uh, I didn't have the tools back in 1991 that I have now, um, but if I could sit down with little Danny John in 1991, I would say, here, here, take this dumbbell, go for a walk, and uh, I think it would have helped uh, immensely. Uh, always, oh, you always got great questions, so so thank you. Uh, Graham. Graham says, I recently heard you mention doing uh, something about chins, dips, and squats being three great exercises for minimalist training program. I can't find the segments in the podcast. Can you tell me where I can find them? Yeah. Uh, it's a chapter in Easy Strength Omni Book. It's available at danjohnuniversity.com slash bookstore. Yeah, I have a whole chapter on it, but let me just summarize it for you. Um, and, then, and there's nothing new about this. This, you know, if you go to the Bill Hinburn site, if you read any of those strength and health magazines uh, from the 50s and 60s, they'll talk about the dip, chin, and uh, uh, high, high rep back squat all the time. I don't know why they're so magical. Maybe because there's, those three exercises can all be done so full range. There's such an obvious, you know, miss or make on them. Uh, well, except for the back squat, you know, you can always do, damn it, if you can always do one more, you can always do one more squat. That's the worst part of high rep back squats. I remember when, the first time I did uh, 50 uh, back squats with 225. I mean, I was finished by 28. And then I did 29, and then I did 30, and, you know, about 10 minutes later, I did 50. At least it seems like it anyway. And I was breathing, you know, 8, 9, 10, 15 breaths per, per rep. Uh, it was tough. But the dip, if you can do them now, some people don't like it because it hurts their sternum. And some people can't do them because of shoulders. But if you can do dips, if you can do chin-ups, now chin-ups, not pull-ups, but chin-ups, and if a high rep back squat, and you take those three exercises seriously three days a week, oh, you, you can do marvelous things. Uh, I mean, is that all you possibly need to do? Well, I remember when Robbie Robinson told me on the beach that he basically did front squats, straight leg deadlifts, and then uh, bench press and pull-up workouts. That was his training. And he would do multiple supersets of those. That's what he told me. Um, and uh, so, yeah, you can you can make great progress on minimal training. Um, always with minimalist training is you have to have, you have to come into it with some, with a background of, of strength training, a background of working out, uh, going straight into minimalism. Probably, I mean, obviously something is better than nothing, but what happens sometimes is a minimal program, uh, because the nervous system is figuring out what to do, the recovery system is figuring out what to do, you're just not, you're not giving enough work to the body, not enough load, not enough reps to, to get anything out of, enough out of minimalist training when a, a person comes along. Um, what, what, I, I think there's some real good like kettlebell minimalist programs, but if you give a beginner of those programs, they don't get anything out, well, okay, they, they don't get the benefits of kind of a beat up, overworked person gets out of them. Um, I hope that helped. Remember, easy strength on your book, okay? I uh, got a question from Neil. Uh, you were nice enough, you bet I was. You were nice enough to answer my question regarding staying disciplined with diet on the road. I have been following most, see already we have an issue of, the, of this advice, and I've been eating fairly clean, another, another point, fairly clean, and drinking at least a gallon of water every day. I just got to tell you, Neil, and this, just remember this, and all the gentle listeners out there remember this too. It's got to be, now, if you have, like I have three cheat days a year now, Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving, Christmas Day, and Super Bowl Sunday. I don't care. I mean, if there's Fritos, you, you know, I'll be the guy with all the orange on his face. Uh, I mean, I eat nachos. I, I, whatever's there, I eat. I just eat it. So having three cheat days a year means I have 362 days a year to undo any damage. Oddly, there's almost no damage if you only have three cheat days a year. Oddly. 
This, this past year, I weighed less on Super Bowl Monday than I did on Super Bowl Sunday after gorging myself all day on things you should not eat. That's the way the human body works, and don't ask me. But one of the things I want you to think about in this question, Neil, is, you know, I want you to think about this, this most and the fairly. Uh, if I ask you to drink a gallon of water a day, I expect you to drink a gallon of water a day. Of In 31 days in a month, if you tell me I did it 20, well, you're a D student, man. You know, that's 66. You're, you know, you're one step from failing. Um, so I just, just a caveat, a reminder. By the way, I just finished a massive road trip, and I know how hard it is to eat good food on the road. I appreciate it. I know. But, you know, again, do your best, and then ask yourself every day, did I do, did I really do my best, or am I just, you know, pretending to do my best? Okay. My question is this, how would Dan recommend combining the rite of passage with the humane burpee or would he even attempt to do them together in a single workout? I have been traveling a 28 kilo bell and some pull-up rings and can do both in the same workout. Well, you know, if, you, if you're doing the three days a week uh, where you're doing the rite of passage, I would do the rite of passage three days a week. It's a three-day week program, and on those days, you clean and press, you do pull-ups, which you seem to know, you do snatches, and then, the, uh, 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 and then on the other day of week, you do the same thing. I, I'm sorry, you do swings, and on the other day of week, you do snatches. Two days a week, you swing. One day a week, you snatch. Um, that's three workouts a week. Lots of presses, lots of pull-ups, lots of presses, lots of pull-ups, lots of presses, Lots of pull-ups, swings, swings, snatches. Is if you look at that week like this, uh, I can see if you wanted to do it, you could add the humane burpee in on these days, on those very uh, on those variation days. Um, I think it'd be really good if you could go Monday, Wednesday, Saturday with the rite of passage, okay, and maybe Friday do the humane burpees. Uh, one day a week is probably going to be enough. Uh, you're going to do a lot of goblet squats on those days. Now, if you do want to, you can do what I recommend for the uh, armor building complex. If you really want to push this, try doing maybe Tuesday, Friday, one week of the Humane Burpee. The next week, just one. The following week, twice. The next week, one. Two, uh, you know, when you take the calendar, it's two Humane Burpees this week, second week, one, third week, two fourth week one um, it's really hard to do the humane burpee and the rite of passage together in the same workout certainly doable and I, I think we did it on the coyote uh, point kettlebell club I'm pretty sure we did it uh, a few times uh, the only problem is we were only trained one day a week and so that one day a as a group so that one day a week we would do tons of mobility we would do really hard pressing. We'd do lots of loaded carries, and then we'd do something like the humane burpee. So it was a hard, hard day. And then the other couple days a week, you know, we'd train on your own. At the time, I had a, I had a gym in the complex I was at, where I was, you know, I would do, uh, I would go in and do machines two days a week. Uh, another day a week on my on my balcony overlooking the San Francisco Bay, um, I would do, uh, you know lots of swings and you know presses um, so it is possible to do it but then the other six days a week can't be right of passage I don't think uh, if you do want to experiment after a month the idea I gave you where you do the humane burpee on your heavy workout just one day a week on your on the heavy right of passage day uh, get back to me and see how that works we could later slide over something else to uh, Maybe the light day, uh, I would say more mobility work on the light day, more tonic work on the light day, and maybe a, a scaled down version of humane burpee on the medium day, if if you do the whole month first, okay? Well, that's, that's it for questions today. As always, I really appreciate the questions that come in. Uh, these were very good. Uh, if you have questions, uh, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, each week I sit down at a chair, no matter where I am in the world, and I answer them for you. And 
Until next time, let's all keep lifting and learning. Thank you.